we would play today like we were laying at the feet of Jesus, looking up into his eyes. And that we would lead the way so those singing with us could lay at the feet of yes. Jesus and look up into his eyes. Yes. Can we realize and fathom mm. a life without the love of our Savior? The darkness that that would ensue. Once we come to know it, Father, may we never take it for granted, Father. And may we realize that there's people out there right now that aren't experiencing that love, Father. Make it real to us. Make it real to us. I was thinking while we were singing that song, he never does give up on us, you know. He always is always there, you know. We just gotta ask and just he'll be there for us. Amen. Amen. Well, I've been talking about, you know, going on control and lately the last few weeks we've been talking about how the enemy attacks. And every time I say, Well, Lord, I was working my way through Revelation and I want to move on to the next church, God says, Nope, it's not time yet. There'll be a time that I put that back on your heart. You're going to go back in and finish the seven churches. But there's something I want you to talk about. The Lord put it on my heart. He said, you always tell your leadership that if you do a sermon on the love of God, it will draw them to step out in faith in ways that no other sermon ever could. If you can just give them a glimpse of the love of God, just for a moment of my love to them, it's going to change their lives. We're ever, ever growing closer to him in every step that we take. So I want to start today by reading Romans chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. When you're patrolling and the enemy tries to attack you. This morning we had a conversation with our worship team. And I said, when you're in a war zone, you never, ever, ever recognize a leader. The leader may walk up to you and say, okay, this is what the plan is today. But he removes insignia, he takes it off, you cease to salute him. If you salute your leadership in a war zone, that can actually bring disciplinary actions. Because the enemy does nothing but just sit and watch all day and says, who is their leader? And the very minute that you recognize that leader and you salute or you do something in a war zone, that person now becomes a target. Because the enemy says, my goal is to take out the leader. Mm -hmm. So those of you who are leaders, those of you who have been voted in, remember that. One of the ways that Satan comes at us and he tries to defeat us, last week he said, you know what, you stink. But we've seen... God doesn't care about that. The last thing that Jesus was worried about when he raised Lazarus was the fact that he might stay. That never even came into mind. So then when Satan gets foiled and you say, I resist you, Satan, get behind me. The next thing he says is, well, God couldn't love you because you messed up this week. So that love is kind of, it's not there. And that is something that the enemy will whisper in our ear every minute of our lives. Because he knows if he can get us to believe that for a split second, we're going to step away from God. We might, that might hinder that step of faith we were going to take. The person we were going to go talk to, the person we were going to go edify, lift up, and build, we might think I'm not good pastors, it's a daily challenge. Daily challenge to live life every day and then still somehow be a leader when you still manage to slam your fingers in the door of the truck or you get out and you spill coffee down the front of yourself and you have one of those moments. You know? You don't swear, but there was some very unholy silence. <laughs> and people are watching you. They watch everything that you're doing way you react and the things that happen to you. And so remember that. And one thing he says is God doesn't love you. 
Romans chapter 5. Now, just a little bit about Romans. Paul wrote it. He was on his way to Jerusalem, and he said, I'd really like to go to this church, but I can't right now, so I'm going to write this letter. And there could be a whole movie made about this. He was, he was carrying a donation that somebody had given him, and he was bringing it to the church in Jerusalem, and they were really struggling. They needed that, they needed that money, and Paul was in charge of carrying it. And so then, then there could be a whole movie made on Phoebe, and he gives her the letter and says, you need to deliver this to this church. But because he couldn't go and talk to them, we end up with one of the greatest theological letters that Paul has ever written. The book of Romans is the foundation of our belief system. Have you ever thought, man, if I was stranded on a desert island, I could only have one book out of the Bible? It depends. If I was stranded with my wife, I'd want Song of Solomon. But <laughs> if I was by myself, I would probably pick Romans. So, Romans 5, 5 through 10. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Whole nother sermon there. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Maybe you could circle that in your Bibles or highlight it with your electronic, however that works nowadays. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would dare to die. But God demonstrates, let's underline this, his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, we were ungodly, he died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, shall we be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God proved his love for us by what he was willing to give up, and that was his son. In Amazon, if you go to Amazon and you look up book titles. There are 2,652 books regarding heaven. 10,304 books for money. 16 some thousand books for sex. 18,818 for God. And 30,066 books on love. Love is one of the deepest human needs of all. Yet it is also a very misunderstood and misused concept. That's right. I want to give you an illustration of how it can be misused. A husband and a wife each had a diary. And one day they were kind of really struggling. And in a wife's diary she wrote, Tonight I thought my husband was acting weird. We had made plans to meet at a restaurant for dinner. I was shopping with my friends all day long, so I thought he was upset at the fact that I was a bit late, but he made no comment at all. Conversation wasn't flowing, so I suggested that we go somewhere quiet so we could talk. He agreed, but he didn't say much. I asked him what was wrong, and he said, nothing. I asked him if it was my fault that he was upset. He said he wasn't upset and had nothing to do with me and not to worry about. On the way home, I told him I loved him. He smiled slightly, but he kept driving. I can't explain his behavior. Dear diary, I don't know why he didn't say, I love you too. When we got home, I felt as if I'd lost him completely, as if he wanted nothing to do with me anymore. He just sat there quietly and watched TV. He continued to seem distant and absent. Finally, with silence all around us, I decided to go to bed. Go to bed, and about 15 minutes later, he came to bed. But he still felt he was distracted, and his thoughts were somewhere else. He fell asleep, and I cried. I didn't know what to do. I'm sure his thoughts are with someone else. My life is a disaster. So then she crept down the stairs, and she thought, I'm going to read his diary. 
She opened it up, and there were two sentences. A one-foot golf putt. How could I have missed a one-foot <laughs> golf putt? <laughs> Sometimes we are that far off when we're thinking about love. That far off. You ask a couple who's been married 50 years and you say, did you jump out of bed with butterflies every day? And did you sense this kind of love every day like you felt like when you walked down the aisle? And they're going to say, no, that didn't happen every day. But I made the choice to love. Love is a choice. It's not a feeling. One of the first churches I pastored, you know how I say present yourself? That was the thing that I, I harped on for like a year straight. Love is not a choice, or love is a choice, it's not a feeling. And we got the, the kids all came in from Sunday school one time and they lined up on the church altar for pastor appreciation and they held hands and the teacher said, what do you have to say? And they said, pastor, love is a choice, not a feeling. And it just is a moment that is very important to me. Because that's exactly what it is. And Jesus demonstrated that. Many times we misunderstand love. When a man wants to prove his love for a woman, what does he do? He writes a poem. He composes a song. He might buy her an expensive gift. He might even ask her to marry him. What did God do to prove his love for us? And in Romans 5 eight, it gives us that answer. God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Amen. Man. Sometimes when I think about preaching on love, I think, well, Lord, am I kind of whipping out? Isn't that the easy way to go? But it's very complicated because we complicate it. The big idea, God proved his love for us by what he was willing to give up his son. So why does God love us? In John 1, 1 John 4, verse 8. Now I'm going to go to the next thing. I had, or can we go to the one before this? Oh, keep going. Next one. No, I'm sorry, the other way. Next one. There we go. Today, I, I, as I was laying in bed last night and I was falling asleep, I thought, I don't have a Mac because I'm preaching on God's love. And my wife gets really upset if I don't have a Mac. But she really likes the Mac. So I thought, I'm going to put every part of the earth that God loves, which is the whole thing. So there we go. There's our Mac. Now, was that? Is it not on there? I thought it was. That part that curves up into the top. Well, God loves that too. <laughs> anyway, what is love? So the dictionary defines love, and I like to say my relative defines love, because Heidi's grandmother's grandfather's name was Webster. Heidi's grandfather, my wife's ancestry, wrote the dictionary. So when I say that, you guys know what I'm talking about. And it's actually true. Didn't see any of that money. <laughs> what is love? The dictionary usually defines love as a deep affection or fondness. But the Bible describes it as self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's a story of a man, and he thought, I just want one word of wisdom. I'm going to climb up to heaven and scratch at heaven's gate. And somehow he managed to do it. And an angel came out. And the angel said, what are you doing? It's not your time yet. And he said, I just need one word of wisdom. Something that will change my life. What can you give me? And the angel said, oh, God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe shall not perish. There you go. The most impactful verse that you will ever read. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's in Ephesians 5.25. Can you imagine, husbands, loving your wife the way Christ loved the church? That's a pretty high calling. A very, very high calling. In Galatians 
2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The action of God's love. This next slide, Romans 5, 8. We were given the gospel in four words. Christ died for us. So let's take those words apart. Every one of those four words is extremely important. The person who died, Christ. Jesus Christ is God. We believe that in this church. 100% God, 100% man. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, John 1.14. John 1.1 1, 1 says, the Word was God. Why did, become, why did God become man? So He could die for us. That cosmic plan was put into place before God ever even breathed life into Adam. He made that plan because He knows the beginning and He knows the end. Would you be willing to become so I've often thought, when I was a little kid and I made Play-Doh people, and you would think, you know, if I did create something, would I be willing to let myself become one of them and then let them torture me and kill me, and would I become a sacrifice for them? I don't know, it's just, I guess, something you kind of think about as a child. Maybe a, a weird child, like... <laughs> would you, Christ died willingly. It is appointed unto men once to die, in Hebrews 9, 27. For us, death is an appointment, but for Christ, it was a choice. He actually made the choice to become man and then died for us. In John 10, 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Woo! John 10, 18, no one takes it from me. But I lay it down of myself. Can I get an amen? amen? I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. He obeyed the Father's will even unto death. Okay, so Christ, now the next word. The death he died, the word died. Christ became obedient to death even the death on the cross. In Philippians 2.8, that's what it says. He became obedient to death. He didn't experience an ordinary death. He suffered the death of the cross and the sins of the world. I don't think we can ever understand what that takes. It's a quick lesson. I might actually talk about this next week, but, you know, when Peter, he messed up. He thought, no way could God love me. And <laughs> when God got in front of him, it was just like, come on, let's move on. That's what I get when I read those verses, when, when Jesus stood Peter up and he's like, okay, do you love me? Okay, Peter, do you love me? All right, let's go to work. And that was so impactful to Peter. History has it that when Peter died, he was crucified, and he said, I don't want to be crucified like my Lord, so crucify me upside down. And you think as those nails were pounded into Peter, and he hung there gasping for breath and life. That he just did that because of his love for God. That's how much it affected him. And I believe it all goes back to that moment when he had given up. He's out fishing again. He went back to normal life because he thought, no way God can love me now. I done messed up. Any one of us ever said that? Unless you're reading the King Jamin. I have done Mestus upeth lordeth. <laughs> so Christ died in humiliation and agony. We view the cross much differently than people of the first century did. Today we adorn our cemeteries and our churches with crosses. People wear them around their necks. In ancient times, though, crucifixion was a horror and a shame. It was a death inflicted on criminals and people that weren't worthy to even be recognized as citizens by the Romans. The cross was so offensive to the Romans that they refused to allow their own citizens to be crucified, no matter what they had done. Think about that. If you actually were a murdering, thief, rapist, whatever, you could not be crucified. That's how repugnant it was to them. 
There's a Roman historian. He was an orator, and he called crucifixion a most cruel and disgusting punishment. He said it was a crime to put a Roman citizen in chains. It's an enormity to flog one, sheer murder to slay them. What shall I say of crucifixion? It is impossible to find the words for such an abomination to do that to a Roman citizen. That's how they view. So we see the cross sometimes differently through history because it's become such a symbol to us. But back then, it was not even worthy of a dog. And that's how Jesus ended up on that cross. Let the very mention of the cross be far removed, not only from a Roman citizen's body, but from his mind, his ears, and his eyes. That's what the Roman historian wrote. Those crucified were made a public spectacle, often being affixed to crosses in bizarre positions, and their bodies left to be devoured by vultures for hours, if not days. The person would hang in the heat of the sun, stripped naked and struggling to breathe. In order to avoid an asphyxiation, he must push himself up with his legs and pull with his arms, triggering muscle spasms. This caused unimaginable pain. The end would come through heart failure, brain damage caused by a reduced oxygen supply, suffocation and shock. Atrocious physical agony. A length of torment that was unimaginable and public shame combined. Think about the public shame when they talk about the fact that a Roman citizen could never be brought to this lowness. And that's what they did to Christ. And he made the choice to do it. He wasn't forced. He said, willingly I go. Imagine the Son of God nailed naked to a cross. The way he died, let's go to the word for. Christ died for. That equals on behalf of. Get back to the original Greek. On behalf of. Christ died in my place. During the U.S. Civil War, there was a farmer, and there's a story out there, and his last name was Blake, and he was drafted as a soldier, and his wife had just died, and he was taking care of his children. And he got called into service in the Civil War. And his neighbor heard about this and knew his situation. So we, he went and took his little draft paper and said, I'm going to go in your place because I know your situation. The guy's name was Charlie, and he was actually killed in the very first battle. <clears throat> when the farmer heard this news, he saddled up his horse, he rode out to the battlefield, he found the body of his friend, and he arranged to have it buried in the churchyard where they used to always sit and talk. And on a piece of marble, he carved the inscription with his own hands. It was roughly done, but with every blow of a hammer and a chisel, tears fell from his eyes, and he placed a marker on the grave of his devoted friend, who became his substitute. Many villagers wept as they read the brief but touching inscription, He died for me. Christ died for me in my place as my substitute. So, for, in place of, in place of me. And then, the last word, us, Christ died for us. Think about how we are described in Romans 5. It describes all of humanity. Christ died for the powerless in verse 6, which means helpless, because we are unable to save ourselves. It's often said, people say, God helps them who help themselves, but that's not biblical. But Romans 5 teaches that God helps them that cannot help themselves. The helpless, that's who he died for. The ungodly, in verse 6, those who refuse to worship God, he died for the ungodly. The sinners, in verse 8. The enemies, in verse 10. Christ died for sinners. He died for the ungodly. And he died for enemies. The nature of God's love is unequal. In these verses, it says, his own love. I told you to underline. Very rarely will anyone die, if you read in verse 7, very rarely, there's another slide for this, 
Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. That's in Romans 5, 7. So this verse is interpreted in a couple of different ways. One interpretation, there's a difference between a righteous person and a good person. A righteous person is just someone we respect, but a good person is someone we love. What he's saying is, even in our earthly minds, we're probably not going to die for someone we respect. We may die for someone we love. And even that, there's a chance to it. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. So the pinnacle of human love is the giving of one's life for a person that one is close to. A spouse, a child, a best friend. You hear about mothers in rivers and they're holding the child as they drown out of the water. And there's true stories about that. The love of a mother. Think about that when you think about the choice that God made for us. God sent his son to die for people who hated him. When we were his enemies, neither righteous nor good, in verse 10, Christ died for us. Christ's love is undeserved while we were still sinners. In Romans 5.20 it says that, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Think about grace. It's a whole other sermon. Can't go there. We have enough time. <laughs> Someone has said that in the gospel we discover we are far worse off than we thought and far more loved than we ever dreamed. God's love is universal. The next slide. Every person on this earth is the object of God's love, not just the good people. So that's what the point of this is. When you're struggling, you think, oh, I blew it this week. God doesn't love me. It says he loved the ungodly, the enemies, the sinners, and he came to die for them. So how much more now that you're a child of his and you're telling yourself, you're letting the enemy tell you, he doesn't love you. Every person on this earth is the object of God's love, not just the good people. And I have up here on the wall, but God's love is so personal, Christ gave himself for me in Galatians 2.20. So instead of me, insert your own name and make the verse your own. Do that sometime in your Bible. Take that verse, Galatians 2.20. Christ gave himself to Bob Wainwright. Christ gave himself to Bob Sales. Christ gave himself to Dave Hunt. Christ gave himself to Neil. Morissette. I was, I was mangling a name, so I was hesitant to say it, but I gave it a shot. Did I get close? Is, is it French? That's why. <laughs> I still don't even attempt Rance's last name. My response to God's love. So what is my response to God's love? I should receive God's gift of love. That's what it takes. Receive it. God offers eternal life to whoever would like to receive it. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Greatest verse ever written. Greatest wisdom, the greatest love, the greatest everything that's ever been shared is in that verse. D.L. Moody, everybody ever heard of him? Famous theologian. He invited a young man named Henry Morehouse to come and preach at his church in Chicago. And he had to actually leave, and he was a little nervous because the kid was young. And he came home, and he said to his wife, so how did uh, Henry Morehouse, how did he preach? And his wife said, actually, people really loved him. So D.L. Moody went to Morehouse and he said, well, you preached a whole series of sermons. What did you preach on? And he said, just one verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I just preached on that verse all week. I never left the verse. Sermon after sermon after sermon. One verse. And D.L. Moody, when you read his book, he was amazed. D.L. Moody said, well, how, how is he doing this on one? 
And D.L. Mooney initially was a little bit of a hellfire and brimstone preacher. So he went and he heard Henry Morehouse and he was preaching on the love of God. And D.L. Mooney says, my life was changed from that moment forward when I realized that a sermon on God's love could impact me way more than anything else that I've ever read in the Bible. Great story if you get a chance to read it. I should be sure that God loves me while we were still sinners. If God loved me before I was a child of his, I shouldn't wonder how he loves me now. I should love God in return. I love, we love him because he first loved us. 1, 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. How do I prove that I love God? By obeying his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands. 1 John 5, 3. This is love for God, to obey his commands. I should love others in the same way God loves them. In 1 John 4, 11, it says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Children are wonderful. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something, as that child grows, there's going to be nothing more impactful in their life than to at least see three quarters of the people in the congregation listening to the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 1 John 4.11. I'm going to say that one more time. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And that love was a choice. Did you ever wake up in the morning and you're like, man, I'm rough. <laughs> like, you can't get to the toothbrush fast enough. <laughs> you're like, man, oh man, I don't know what is going on. But did you ever think, the way I am right now, no way God can love me. Because we're basing it on how we see ourselves at that moment. And that's not how we need to look at God's love in our life. Because there's many, many times that I wake up in the morning, and at least in my eyes, I'm not lovable. But I have to know that no matter how I feel, God made that choice to love us. <clears throat> and that inherently is the problem in the world today. You can't turn on a TV show and not hear someone say, I'm sorry, I've just fallen out of love with you. Because love is a choice. But the ratings aren't as high when you hear, I've decided just not to love you. <laughs> that doesn't matter. And did you ever see these TV shows where they're kind of friends, and then they have a moment, they stare at each other's eyes, and then it reverts to a next scene, and they're cooking breakfast together, and suddenly they're in love. They're hanging all over each other, and you're like, so the world is showing us that love is nothing more than a physical thing and a feeling at the moment. And God is saying it's the exact opposite. And my challenge when I'm meeting with couples is I'll tell them, if you learn to decide to love your spouse, the feelings will come. Because those are blessings of God. But the first thing is a choice, regardless of how I feel. I'm here for the long run. Who should we love? Remember that Christ died for his enemies. He prayed, Father, forgive them. Love your enemies in Matthew 4, 544. That's a rough one. We can all think of somebody that we look at as an enemy. I love scrolling through Facebook sometimes and you see, oh, love God, love, they have all these verses. And then there'll be something about some criminal that something happened to him and you see people, I hope he burns, I hope he rots in a prison, I hope he, and you're like, wait a minute, where was the love? It was just two, two posts up. How will you respond to God's love for you? So as we close right now, we're going to prepare for our uh, communion. If you want to start coming forward section by section, 
in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. With the cross in mind, through the lens of the cross, think about this. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So today, as you work your way up here and you receive communion, let's just think about that cross in the eyes of God's love for us. About God's love, sometimes we think, what does it have to do with me? I am not in a place where God can love me. I need to get fixed first, and then I'm going to be ready to be loved, Lord. Give me a few more days. I just need to get over this hang-up that I have in my life. Then, Lord, you can love me. If that's the way you're thinking, then communion has everything to do with are you one who has never really thrown true love? Never realized that Christ loved you with the passion and the choice that he does. To be touched with such love is to throw yourself at his feet in adoration and marvel that you could ever, ever receive such a compassionate love. Wouldn't you allow the hardness of your heart to melt before God's love and allow Jesus Christ to be your Savior? Perhaps you're somebody that's already accepted the love of God. You have believed in Christ, but the reality of that love has somehow become a little distant to you. Maybe through life's trials recently, you've struggled accepting and really believing that that love is solely for you. And last, does your love change when the person whom you love does not respond quickly or does not hold firm? Do you continue to love when your wife, husband, child, or friend does not seem to see things the way you do or maybe contradicts you? Do you love as Christ loved? Are you called to show forth that love? Yes, you are. As we celebrate communion, and again, the bread is on the top of the cup. I know that a few times as people didn't realize how that worked. Kind of a COVID thing happening, so we're not sharing anything. I'm going to read this again. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on some night, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, Take this. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance. If you haven't already done so, let's share the bread.
as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes again. If there has been a moment in this past week in which you doubted God's love right now, you just need to say, Lord, I'm ready to be loved. I know you've always loved me, but I've stepped away because I've listened to the enemy's lies that you couldn't love me in the state that I'm in. But your word says that you love the ungodly, you love the sinner, and you love your enemy. So how much more do you love your child? Step into his light right now, sit at the feet of the cross and gaze up at his eyes and experience that. Bob, could you close us in prayer? Lord, we thank you as much as we possibly can for what you did on the cross for us. You did what we couldn't do for ourselves. Help us to understand the debt we owe you and how we can live to glorify your name. Lift you up so that all men will be drawn yes. to you, Lord. Father, as the service ends, I pray it's the beginning of us having a deeper love for you by living the life that you have laid out for us to do, your plan for us. Yes. As it unfolds each and every day that we seize the moment, yes. that we see the opportunities you give us, that we act upon them glorify your name. So Lord, we know that those opportunities are out there in our community, our neighbors, our family, our co-workers. There's no shortage, Lord God, of those in need of your love. Yes. But Lord, you tell us that the workers are few. Impress our hearts to rise up to be the ones the hearts of those who desperately need you, yes. who may know it, who may not even know it. Yes. Lord, all eternity is before us. Help us to seize each moment, each day that you bless us with. For our days are numbered, and you are soon coming. Yes. Find us faithful, Lord. Yes. Find us working for your glory.